All right, all right, all right. Hello, hello, hello. Take a seat, CLB, take a seat, take a seat. Wow, we're, we're chatty this morning, I love it. We have good energy in this room. And the sun's out, it's gonna be a beautiful day today. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Hey, welcome to City Light Bennington. If you haven't met me or don't know me, my name is Vaughn Perez and I actually am the student pastor here at CLB. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, if you're a middle school and high school student and I haven't met you or you're a parent of one, I'd love to chat with you. Come talk to me after, after church. But hey, thanks for all being here this morning with busyness of summer, with life, with work. I'm sure most of you are traveling. I'm just grateful for mornings like these where we can gather, slow down, and study God's word together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, if you're new to our church or haven't been here in a while, maybe you're visiting for the first time, I just want to say welcome. Welcome to CLB. We're glad you're here. Today, church, will be in Luke chapter 15. We'll be in Luke chapter 15. And I'll be teaching over arguably Jesus' most famous parable, and that's the parable of the prodigal son. Before we start, let me pray. Well, King Jesus, thank you so much for mornings like this where we can gather together as a church family. God, I pray for those in this room who don't have a true intimate relationship with you. God, would you open their eyes and their hearts towards you? God, would you remind them that you love them, that you care for them? God, I also pray for those in this room who love you. God, would you also remind them that you love them and trust in them and are faithful to them? So King Jesus, be here in this room. Holy Spirit, have your way this morning. Teach us something new or reteach us something old. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Awesome. So I t- I've titled my sermon, Two Lost Sons. Before we jump into the story, I want to give a little context to where we're at in Luke 15. We see in Luke 13, Luke tells us that Jesus is on his way, journeying and traveling through villages and towns on his way to Jerusalem. So we can assume that Jesus is making pit stops and teaching about the kingdom of heaven. And in Luke 15, Jesus is with two groups of people. He's with the Pharisees and scribes, as it says in this text, and the tax collectors and the sinners. And when the Bible is referring to sinners, it's talking about prostitutes or other immoral people that are considered immoral. And these are two important groups to remember, church. In this chapter, Jesus tells us three different parables. He talks about the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and finally the the prodigal son, the parable of the lost son. In verse two, we see the Pharisees actually grumble and scoff at Jesus for inviting tax collectors and sinners, who in this society was viewed as the lowest of low. And if you remember, Pharisees are actually high-ranked Jewish leaders that held the Mosaic law to such a high degree and standard. And so Jesus inviting tax collectors and sinners was, to them, it was unacceptable because an invitation to sit down and eat was an invitation and an acceptance into the group. And so we see these Pharisees as these rule followers. They see Jesus inviting these tax collectors and sinners as an act of uncleanliness. And, and they're putting shame and condemnation not on the tax collectors and the sinners, but actually towards Jesus himself. And so these three key parables are used to address what I believe is a, another heart issue. And so let's take a look first at Luke 15, verse, seven, verse 4 to 7, the lost sheep. Read with me. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go over the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need repentance. In the story, this parable talks about a shepherd who loses one sheep out of his 100. 
And if you, know, if you don't know anything about sheep, contrary to popular belief, they're actually pretty intelligent creatures, but they wander the most out of any other animal. On top of that, they're also the most helpless. In short, what this story teaches us is that God is willing to leave the 99 for the sake of the one. He's willing to save the one lost soul. See, our God is a God who seeks, and our God is God who seeks those, especially who need his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, his love, and most importantly, his salvation. Church, he wants the lost back into his flock. Read with me in Luke 15, 8 to 10, we'll see the story of the lost coin. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of heaven, of God, over one sinner who repents. In this parable of the lost coin, Jesus is speaking of a woman who loses one of her ten silver coins. And in this context, in this day of age, it's a big deal for this woman because one of those ten ten silver coins, most likely in this culture, you have ten silver coins strung around the neck, signifying the mark of a married woman. And so this lost coin is not just loose change or extra money she's looking for. It's actually one of symbolic and sentimental value. And with the story here, the lesson that Jesus is portraying here, that even though this woman loses her precious coin, it's still under the possession of the woman. Meaning that those who are lost belong to God, whether they know it or not. He's the creator of our souls. He's a lover of our lives. And it's just a sweet reminder that God values each and every one of us. And church, someone needs to hear this today. God values you. God loves you, whether you know it or not. You are his, he is yours, and he created you with purpose and intention. The common denominator between these two stories is that Jesus is is emphasizing rejoicing. It ends with rejoicing, rejoicing for just the one, rejoicing for just one salvation. God rejoices when one lost soul is found. Church, do we do that? But we have to ask, what does it mean to be lost? What does it actually look like to be a lost soul? Well, a little bit about my story. I actually grew up in the Catholic faith. I heard little. uh, I learned about Jesus. I learned about God. I learned about the Holy Spirit, the, the whole Trinity. But I had little to no application of that knowledge to my life. See, my view of church and my relationship with God was that I go to church on Sundays I pray before meals, and then occasionally I'll go to CCD or religious education on Wednesday nights. That was it. That was my view of God. That's what I thought was what I had to do. It was a lot of do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Morality was a big emphasis of my life, right, wrong, good, or bad. See, I thought I had a good relationship with God. I didn't get into any trouble with the law. I would serve at the Open Door Mission in high school. I would tend to family members and friends whenever they needed it. I dubbed myself as a good good kid. And I thought that was it. I thought that's what it meant to be right in God's eyes. But boy, was I wrong. As I started getting older, sin started being more evident in my life. In college, I would actually join City Light's first college ministry, not because I actually wanted to, but I I met a cute girl and I wanted to pursue her. (laughs) But when, as college went on, real life started to kick in, and my sinful human nature and the effects of it would rule and reign my life. For example, drinking and partying influenced my lifestyle. Working out and, and idolizing the way I looked, my body was a real thing. Lusting and pornography was a struggle. Wanting to connect with people just so I can get the, make the connection, get the, get the next job, move up the corporate ladder, make the money, be the CEO, that was my goal. Those are real things that gripped my life. Those are real things that distracted me from my love of God. Those are real things that blinded me from what truly mattered. 
They're real idols. And I say all this to make a point. The point is this, that no amount of times that I went to church, no amount of times that I prayed, no amount of acts of good service or deeds or things that I did was getting me into heaven. That's not what a true relationship with God looks like. That was a work for my salvation relationship with God. I treated God as a safety net. See, if God's standard was here, I thought I was here. Good enough to be in right relationship. Good enough to make the cut. Church, I was once spiritually lost. Now finally, I want to contrast my story with the prodigal son. We'll get into main text today. If you read me, Luke 15, 11 to 16, it'll be here on the screen. And he, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. There he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So we see in the story the youngest son demand for a share of property from his dad prematurely. And the disrespect that this son showed by asking for the money prematurely was basically equivalent to spitting in his father's face. It would have been baffling to people at the time that his father would do this. But strangely, strangely enough, his father was willing to give him his share of property and go off on his own. And what happens next? Well, the son wanders into a distant country, and he squanders in reckless living, which we can assume is drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, idolatry, and wickedness. Church, he blew all his money, which I will add it was one-third of his whole family's estate. He blew through all of his wealth. And in verse 16, it said that he was hired as a pig feeder and no one gave him anything. The son ruined his life. He hit rock bottom. He wasted all of his money and he was in desperate, desperate need. He was so low. His life was so low that even the pigs ate more lavishly than he did. The son was truly, truly lost. In church, in my story, I was once truly, truly lost. So what does the son start to do? Well, let's look at verse 17 to 19 here. But when he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So comparatively speaking, his father's servants were living a way more better life than he was. And in his eyes, he didn't mess up only before his earthly father, but his heavenly father. So the son starts to feel ashamed. He starts to feel embarrassed. He felt so ashamed and so embarrassed that he even skipped asking to be part of the family again. And instead, what does he do? He's like, Father, I want to offer myself as one of your servants. So the son starts to practice. He starts to rehearse his pitch to his father. But look what happens when he arrives in verse 20 here. It says this. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran, embraced, and kissed him. His father runs and embraces him. His father felt true compassion for his son. And what what does he do? His father kisses him, which... In con- contrast was, funny enough, it contrasted from him essentially spitting in his father's own face. The church says, this is not foreshadow Jesus dying on the cross for the same people who spat on him, who beat him, who whipped him, mocked him, and crucified him. In this parable, the, the father represents God. And when his, father, when his son comes home, he doesn't get angry, he doesn't get upset, he doesn't ask him, what'd you do with the money? Where did you go? What happened? What does he do? Well, he calls his servants to bring him the best robe, which was most likely his, 
put on a ring on his hand, which signifies acknowledgement back into the family, and to kill the fan calf, traditionally eating, eating for special occasions. And what do they do? They celebrate, they rejoice. The lost son is found. The church, I want you to listen to this. Listen to this really carefully. Being a Christian doesn't mean clean up your act before God. Being a Christian doesn't mean to clean up, you have to clean up your act before having a true relationship with God. Being a Christian doesn't mean follow these rules or don't follow those rules. In fact, Jesus says in John 3 to Nicodemus, he says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So what does it look like to be spiritually found? What does it look like to be born again? Well, to finish off my story, in August 2017 of my life, my eyes were finally opened. After a spiritually low season of my life, I attended City Light Lincoln. I don't remember anything that the pastor preached on, (laughs) but I do remember an analogy. He said, what does your house look like? He's He's referring to your soul. What does your soul look like? Is it clean? Is it are you good? And I, I remember thinking to myself, I was like, yeah, I don't get into any trouble. I do good things. I serve. Yeah, I'm good. But then he says, what does your house look like, look like on the inside? How are the rooms? Are they messy? Are they dirty? Are they dark? Are they filthy? Are they filthy? And he says, if they are, why don't you let Jesus come in because he's knocking at the door? And the pastor referring, if I remember correctly, he was referring to Revelation 3.20. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. Church, it was on that Sunday when the Holy Spirit entered into my heart. It was on that Sunday when I gave my life to Jesus. It was on that day when I finally got it. I finally became friends with God. It was on that day when I became spiritually lost to spiritually found. I finally understood what it meant for Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And I could not get there without realizing the weight of my sins, similar to the younger son. Remember, Christianity is not a rules-based religion. Instead, it's a relationship based on faith that transforms people from the inside out. I'm gonna repeat that. Christianity is not a rules-based religion. It's a relationship based on faith that transforms people from the inside out. And God is not in the industry of making bad people good. He's in the industry of making dead hearts alive. The Bible doesn't teach us that there are bad people and there are good people. No, the Bible tells us that we're all bad and that Jesus should be the hero of our story, that he is a savior of our souls. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 3. I love this. For everyone has sinned and falls short of God's glorious standard. It's very humbling. There's a standard set, but it's not from humans. You see, the story of the lost sheep, lost coin, and the younger son, they all represent the irreligious, the, the rule breakers. But remember, in this context, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. He's, he's using these stories not to speak into the heart of the irreligious, the rule breakers. He's actually telling these stories and address the heart of the religious, the rule followers. Let's see how the older bro- brother responds in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and treated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, when this son of yours, he doesn't even acknowledge his brother as his brother, came and who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. The brother doesn't care about a party. He doesn't care that his brother is safe and sound. He's angry, he's upset, he's jealous. Why? Because he believed he had to earn his father's favor. 
He wanted to be loved like how his younger brother, or younger, yeah, like the younger son was, but he thought he had to earn his God's love, or his father's love. See, church, he was disconnected from a real relationship with his father. Not because of a lack of his father's love, but because of his own pride. And I love what First John 3 says. It says, what great love the father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Church, our view of God should not be of a drill sergeant or a boss, but one of a loving father. The father's love is available, and the father's love was available to the older brother, and we see that in his response. Look at verse 31. Son, you are always with me, and all that I have, all that is mine, is yours. The older brother is also a lost son, and he represents a big heart issue. And this this older brother represents those who are religious, the religious person. Pastor Tim Keller in his book, The Prodigal God, he says this, there's a difference between the gospel and religious moralism. And what is religious moralism? Religious moralism is the emphasis of moral behaviors above genuine faith. Religious moralism is the emphasis of moral behavior above genuine faith. Religious moralisms or being a religious person can look like going to church regularly. It can look like reading your Bible or your devotional daily and praying occasionally. And all these things are good things. They all honor God. That's, but that's not the point. See, in this parable, we have the younger brother who represents the irreligious, right? Those who actively disobey God or maybe those are lost that don't even know it. And we also have those who are religious who, who get too caught up in the nuances of what a Christian actually looks like. And because they think they're a Christian, they, they think they deserve everything God has to offer. But church, Jesus wants to address both parties because both parties miss the mark. Both parties miss the point of the gospel. So actually in this story, we end up having two lost sons. And what does Jesus want us to do? He wants to evaluate ourselves. He doesn't care if you do all the right things. He doesn't care if you're morally better than the person next to you. Because remember, he's not in the industry of making bad people good. He's in the industry of making dead hearts alive. The day that I gave my life to Jesus, God made me alive in him. He changed the condition of my heart. He made my heart not one of stone, not one of hardness, but one of flesh. I became born again. Born into a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. And the biggest difference between my life before and my life now is that now I get to experience God's love on a personal level. I get to feel the Holy Spirit in me. He prompts me, he leads me. He gives me hope when at the, in the past all hope was lost. He gives me direction when in the past I had no idea where, where I was going or what I was doing. He comforts me. He lifts my burdens when my burdens are heavy. He relieves my worry, my stress, my fear, my doubts in times of stress, fear, and doubt. And trust me when I say this, church, you can't experience the true hope and true love without the hope and love of Jesus. And God wants us to be friends with him because he created us to be in relationship with him. And he'll be the best friend that you'll ever have. And the reality is, I'm not perfect. But thankfully, even when I'm not, even when I'm not faithful to God, He is faithful to me. See, because of the Holy Spirit, I can talk to God throughout my day. I can ask Him for wisdom. I can ask Him for advice. I can ask Him to get me through tough situations, hard times. I can thank Him and praise Him when things go well and good things happen. And during a busy day, I can quiet my soul and feel His peace and hear His still small voice. But the good news is, even when I mess up, I can come to a God who I know will always have his arms open to me. I know that God will always still love me, and he'll always still forgive me. This is the reality that everyone who follows Jesus can live in day by day. 
There's nothing on this earth that compares to interacting with the living God. He's the only one that could fill my void that I felt for so long in my life. As we saw in the story, there's a difference, right, between religious moralism and the gospel. Remember, religious moralism is the emphasis of moral behavior, moral behaviors above genuine faith. And there, there's a warning here that religious moralism or, or practices are things that you can do that make you feel better about yourself. But in, in contrast, the gospel brings you into true intimacy with God. And our faith should be in the good news of the gospel. And the gospel is so beautiful. God created a way for us to be made right with him. He created an opportunity to have a real relationship with him, and that was through his son Jesus. See, we're all born into a world of sin, darkness, hopelessness. Eternal separation after this life was our destination. However, he made a way out. He sacrifices one and only son, and after death on the cross, taking on the punishment of our sins, Jesus rose from the grave and conquered death. He paid the cross, he paid the price of the cross so that we may be made free, so that we may be made right with God. And when Jesus rose to heaven after conquering death, he gave us full access through his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is God's spirit in us, which gives us direct communication with God. And because of that, we're able to share the good news, share hope where hope is lost, shine light where there is darkness to family members, friends, and coworkers, loved ones, or even strangers, because that's what God wants. We see that. He wants those who are lost to be found. I was baffled at this, but this same message of the gospel that Jesus preached on this earth 2,000 years ago was halfway across the globe. And 2,000 years later, we're here in this high school auditorium preaching that same message in Omaha, Nebraska. Amen. You know what that tells me? That tells me our God is a God who is alive and moving and ready to bring dead hearts alive. Amen? Amen. One of my favorite verses, my students know this, is Romans 10, 9. You've been confessed with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. But your life doesn't stop when you pray a prayer to Jesus. Your life with Jesus actually begins when you make that decision consciously. And it's up to you to choose whether you pursue a God who's actively pursuing you or not. I want to address the, the person in the room who's not a believer, not a Christian. Maybe they're in one of the two types of categories of the lost, the religious or the irreligious. I wanna invite you into a truth. I wanna tell you that God wants your heart. He wants to take care of you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to hear from you. He wants to walk alongside you. Every emotion, everything you're feeling in your day, good, bad, happy, sad, anything in between. Because contrary to popular belief, our God is not a God who just sits on his throne and is distant and silent. He's a personal God who is present with you and wants you to experience his presence. For the non-Christian, he loves you. I pray that God opens your eyes and heart to understand that. For the Christian, I wanna encourage you. Have you forgotten that God lavishes his love on you? You don't need to earn his favor you don't need to do all these things to earn his love. You are highly favored and loved by God through the blood of Jesus. And Christian, his love for you doesn't stop at the cross. He stands ready to pour out his love to you through his Holy Spirit, who has been freely given to you by faith. You always have access to him, and you can always freely ask for a fresh filling of his Holy Spirit to make that love known to you every moment of your life. Know that love is free, freely given and remember that he has
brought you from dead, death to life. So let us be people who rejoice with heaven when one lost soul is found. If you're in this room and you're, maybe you're categor- categorizing yourself as under one of the types of lost, I want to invite you. After service today, we'll have the altar team come up and, and just pray for you, pray with you. If you want to make that decision in your heart, if you want to actively do what Romans 10, 9 says, believe with your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, come talk to one of us. Come over here in the front after service. We'd love to pray with you. If you're someone here in this room who is found, praise God. But we too want to also pray with you because a Christian walk is not meant to be one walked alone. It's meant to be walked in community, side by side, brothers and sisters in Christ who want to uplift you and point you towards God and the good news of the gospel. And so if you just need some extra, extra prayer or direction or clarity, the altar team will also be available to you too. Remember, I said it before, but I want to say it again. Let us be people who rejoice with heaven when the one lost soul is found. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you for your grace. God, thank you that your grace is freely poured out to us. God, I pray right now that you would open the eyes and hearts of those who are distant from you. God, I pray right now for those saints in the room who just need to be reminded that your love is free. Maybe they feel stale from your love. Maybe they feel some sort of distance as well. God, I ask and I pray that you remind them that your favor is freely given upon them. Lord, thank you for these stories. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for him dying on the cross for our sins. Our sins. Lord, I pray that people in this room feel the weight of their own sin, so much so that they want to say yes to who you are. God, thank you for creating everyone in this room. Thank you for reminding us that you love us, that we are so valued by you, even when we don't feel valued. And Lord, I pray against the enemy. I pray for your Holy Spirit. We know that your spirit is actually the strongest, most powerful spirit on this earth. Lord, I pray for a fresh feeling in the hearts in this room. God, thank you for times like this where we can get together, worship you. God, I pray that we can rejoice, celebrate that, hey, God, you love me, and so I will love you forever and ever. So God, I pray right now for rejoicing as we finish and wrap up, Lord, I pray that we just listen and see the words in these songs and take them to heart. Jesus, I pray that what we heard this morning, even in my own soul, would it not just stay in this room, but we take it and apply it to our life daily. And God, we thank you for who you are. We trust you. And all God's people said, amen.